<laughs> All right. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Merhaba, ve'gunayden, gomarjovat, dilamishvirovisa, tiaguit, madenwa, bon sabah, bon sabato, feliz sabato, shabbat shalom. Shalom, shalom. All right. It's good to see you guys. Um, so last week there were some things I wanted to cover. Um, but because of time, we couldn't cover them. So what we're going to do for the Go Deep at the beginning is I'm going to cover some of the things I wanted to go over last week um, for last week's lesson, not the lesson that we just finished. And I'll do that for a few minutes, and then we'll dive into this week's lesson. So my Go Deep is based on Genesis chapter 45. That's my Go Deep. And it is the chapter where uh, Joseph is talking to his brothers um, after not seeing them for 22 years um, because he was sold into slavery by them and then he became a ruler over uh, Egypt. Okay, um, let's have a quick prayer before we get into this. Um, I'll go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you brought us through another week, Lord. I ask that everybody watching online and everyone here in the congregation and the people that are on their way here, Lord, I ask that everybody receives a special blessing and they can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I invite the presence of the Holy Spirit into this sanctuary. I ask that the Holy Spirit speaks through me and also through the congregants um, as we have this uh, intellectual discourse about your word. And Lord, I just ask that everyone is blessed today. Um, please bless the speaker that's giving the sermon. And Lord, I just pray that each person, um, that they develop a close relationship with you. And if they already have a relationship with you, that it becomes more intimate and deeper. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Thank you for the Sabbath. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this is my go deep. Hello. Um, and it's based on last week's lesson. So we're going to take a few minutes and do this. I don't want to go too long because I want to get into this week's lesson. Okay, so Genesis chapter 45. Um, Kathy, do you mind reading Genesis chapter 45 verses 4, 5, and 6? And then Brother Ron, do you mind reading Genesis chapter 45, um, 7, 8, 9, and 10? So, five through six, Kathy? I thought you said four, five, and six. Oh, sorry, four, five, and six, yeah, sorry. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold me into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to serve God. For these two years, the family has there are still five years in which there will be neither power nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity of the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father. Say unto him, Thus said, the, thus said thy son Joseph, God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, tarry not. Ten? Yep. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. All right, so... First thing I want to ask you guys, who does Joseph acknowledge in verses 4 through 10 of chapter 45? Who does Joseph acknowledge? God. Acknowledges God. How many times does Joseph acknowledge or praise God? You guys can start counting. Three. At least three. I'm seeing real quick here. Let's see through four. One. see three times uh, without reading it again. Okay. All right. So it's four times. So in um, verse five, he says, God sent me ahead of you. Mm -hmm. In verse seven, God sent me to Egypt. Mm -hmm. In verse eight, 
Um, so now it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. And verse 10, God has made me the Lord of all Egypt. So verse, sorry, 9, verse 9, sorry. Okay, so we see four times. So what's really interesting is that um, Joseph was immature when he was a child, and he was sold to Egypt. So he had all these dreams. He's telling his family there's some resentment from the brothers. We see this immaturity. But now we can see in Genesis 45 that he's matured psychologically and spiritually. He grew up, and he gave, gives God all the praise, acknowledgement, and glory to God. Right? Okay. So we should always do that in our lives. All right? So what I want to do right now is I want to tell you that there are 950 names for God in the Bible. So a few months ago, I, I don't know if I was on, on Zoom or if this was live, but I told you guys that in Islam, they have a song called the 99 Names, and it's the 99 Names for God. And I thought, okay, the, our, our Muslim brothers and sisters cannot have cornered the market on this. I know in Christianity and Judaism, there's got to be more than 99, at least 99, if not more, names for God. I'm not going to read all of them. We don't have that kind of time. But I do want to go over some of the names for God because we need to praise God in good and bad situations. So I've gone through some bad times this year, as I'm sure you guys have as well. And I've also had some good things happen this year. But we understand that God loves us and he's merciful. And so we should always be praising him and giving credit to him. And this is what Joseph did in 45. So I'm going to read some of these names. Don't worry, guys, who are watching online. I'm not going to read all 950. But the fact that there are 950 names, these are all describing God's character. And we should be praising God not for the things that he gives us and does for us, but for who he is. So let's go through a few of these. So Abba, which in Greek means father. Um, we also have um, Adam, the last or the second Adam, okay? We have Adonai, um, which means my Lord. We have El Adonai Elohe, okay, which means the Lord God of hosts. We have the advocate. We have Akel Esh, which means a consuming fire. We have the chief cornerstone, okay? We have the almighty. We have the alpha and the omega, the all-sufficient one, the amen the Ancient of Days, the Anointed One, the Apostle and High Priest, the Atoning Sacrifice of our sins, the Author and Finisher of our faith, the Author of external, excuse me, Eternal Salvation, the Author of Life, the Baptizer, the Creator of Israel, the Creator, the Beginning of the Creation of God, the Beloved Son, the Blessed Hope, the Branch, the Bread of Life, the Bridegroom, the Brightness of His Glory, the morning star, um, a buckler to all those that trust in him, by whom all things were made, both in heaven and earth, our champion in battle, the chief apostle, the chief shepherd, the Christ, or the Messiah, the anointed one, um, the Christ, our Passover, the Christ, the power of God, our comforter, confidence of all the ends of the earth, the consolation of Israel, um, the creator of Israel, the dawn from on high, the creator from the ends of the earth, the day spring from on high, the day star, the deliverer, the desire of all nations, um, our master, the door, the door of the sheep, the earnest of our inheritance, I am. I am that I am. The covenant, most high God, mighty God. Uh, we also have the faithful God, the faithful creator, the faithful one, the father of lights, the father of mercies, father of the fatherless, the father of spirits, the father to Israel, the fear of Isaac, the first begotten, the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn of all creation, God of me, God of love and peace, God of my life, God of our salvation, God of patience and consolation, God ready to pardon, God our shield, God who cannot lie, the God who works wonders, God who gives generously to all, God who judges the earth, God the hero, God which gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, God which has not turned away my prayer, God who raises the dead, the God who has been a shepherd on my life, the God who sees, the Godhead, 
God's servant, God's righteous servant. These are just a few, but there is 950 names for our Lord in the Bible. And if you want, um, you can contact me. You can get my email address for me after church, or the pastor or one of the elders can give it to you. And I can actually email this PDF to you that has the 950 names of our Father. And I think that that's very, very important. Um, when we look at last week's lesson with Genesis 45, Joseph acknowledges and praises God. He says to the brothers, it wasn't you who sent me here. God ordained the whole thing. He orchestrated everything. And I think it's really important that, um, that Calvary and the cross and all of that was destined to be. God planned this in advance. So even the things in our lives... Um, that we have happening, God knew about it before it actually ever happened. Okay, so let's get into um, something else. Um, I wanted to have you guys look at uh, Genesis 42. Genesis chapter 42. We're going to be reading verses 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So somebody, Genesis 42. Genesis chapter 42. Okay, can you read um, 18 through 23, Brother Ron? 18, Genesis 42, 18 through 23, uh -huh. did you say? 23, yeah. 23. And Joseph said to them the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are an honest man, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house. But you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses, and bring your younger brother to me, so your word will be verified, and you shall not die. And they said, and they did so. And then they said one to another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us. We would not hear, therefore, this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did not I speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. Okay, so this is also apart from last week, and I'm segueing into this week's lesson. So. These brothers are talking about what they've done to Joseph, how they sold him into slavery, right? That's what they're referring to. And they don't know, they don't recognize him, they haven't seen him for 22 years. When they sold him, he was 17. Now he's past the age of 37, okay? So let me ask you, how does Genesis 42 show us the brothers' repentance? Genesis 42, how does it show us their, their repentance? Uh, there's a section uh, where Reuben speaks, for example. Reuben answered, did I not speak to you, saying, do not sin against this, this, this boy, and you would not listen? Uh, that would not be it. Uh, and Joseph said, no. And therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Oh, is that what? So, oh, okay. yeah, so what's really interesting here is this goes into a discussion about repentance. So let me ask you guys, what would you give as a definition of repentance? That's good. Uh, uh, you know, David says, makes a comment first, you know, he says, we, when we sin, we sin against God first, right? Uh -huh. um, and so when we repent, uh, I'm wondering now, is repentance, is that a, a verbal expression of regret? Uh, uh, that's what I'm thinking of repentance is, is a verbal re expression of regret. Uh, is there anything we can give through this process of forgiving? Um, I'm, I'm not... I wouldn't say I'm sure I can speak to that. I would say normally when we repent, we feel sorry for what we did, and we and we turn away from that thing that we have been doing. Uh -huh. And and maybe what you're 
trying to reach out of me, out of me or us here is maybe um, that we're seeing in this little comments here a, a hint of their regret for what they did and recognizing there is uh, there will be a time that they will end up paying for this in one way or another. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but repentance is, for me is turning away from. Yeah. It's speaking as a spoken thing. Yeah. Anybody else? What would you say is repentance? But inside them, they be haunted them all this time. Mm -hmm. What they've done to their brothers, mm -hmm. and even though they might, I don't know how they live. I mean, the days goes by. You know? Yeah. Inside them, they must have the feeling of not guilty inside them, unless they repent, even though they just say that. But they repent from within, and to say that, you know? Yeah. They own up what they are doing. They, and that it's really, sometimes it's really hard for them, you know, because they think, I don't know how they treated their father, you know, all that time. The father must be suffering, is that you know, they said that what they've done, and then they, they wish they had repented with the father first, but they keep telling, telling lies, the father. We are, their, their father thinks he's dead, and he's been grieving for 22 yeah. years. Well, you know. And they've been keeping this secret. Yeah, that's and now true. this is this outcome where they have, they don't know he's Joseph, there's this pharaoh governor, the governor for, for the pharaoh, who's, you know, falsely accusing him of stealing, saying he wants him to bring the youngest brother, Benjamin, and all this stuff. What were you going to say? But even me, if I tell you that to someone, to my husband, you know, I won't be feeling, you know, there's something in me. I can't hide anything from me. Yeah. So I have to tell you the truth. Yeah. I, I don't know how they feel. And all these people, these boys, these uh, brothers, you know, and now they're going to face Joseph. You know? it's, it's, a, it's a lot. So I'm going to read you the dictionary definition of repentance. So this is from Merriam-Webster. So it says to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life, to feel regret or contrition, to change one's mind. The Oxford Dictionary says it's to feel or express regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing. In the Biblical Greek, it is the word metanoia, changing of mind or change in the inner man. And in a biblical Hebrew, repent is used as two words, shub and nahum. So shub means to return or to turn, and nahum means uh, to grieve or to feel sorry to console oneself. So we see this um, because what we see in these last chapters of Genesis, we see this great story take place with this very dysfunctional family, right? With repentance, and we're going to go to chapter 50 in a minute and look at Joseph's response to his brothers. We're not going there yet, we're about to go there. Okay, so... Well, that's why I, I, I was wondering in your repentance question, and I don't want to go ahead, tell them if I'm going ahead and just cut, no, the, you're question, fine. The, question, just cut the question off. As you mentioned, they had not re told the truth to their parents yet, to their father. Mm -hmm. Are their parents, I would say. Their, their, their father, the yeah. yeah. That, well, they not as far as we can tell. So, has repentance taken place? What level of repentance? Are there levels of repentance based on your definition? Possibly, because um, there's a repentance to man, to the person you've wronged as a human being, and then there's the repentance to God. And the repentance to God we know is more important because that's relate, directly related to our salvation. And I'm actually going to read you something about why why we need to repent to God. Because we always think, well, I have to repent to someone we've wronged on earth because I have to see them again, you know. And I, there might be consequences. Or maybe it's not that. Maybe we actually feel bad about hurting a family member or a friend or neighbor or something. So um, true repentance acknowledges my sin and doesn't point fingers at others. So all the brothers responded and they took the blame. This is what, not first. We see this in Genesis 42, okay. Um, and then if we go to, uh, let's see, Genesis 44, everybody turn to Genesis 44. This is the second time they're falsely accused of stealing um, when Joseph has the divination cup put into Benjamin's sack. Um, I'm not going to have you guys read the whole thing because of time, but I want everybody to go to verse 16. Verse 16 we're reading what Judah had to say. And remember, they had a lot to say about Judah earlier in Genesis. Judah's the one who suggested they sell Joseph into slavery. 
Remember? He was the brother. Reuben was the one who didn't want to do any of it. But Judah's the one who suggested they sell Joseph into slavery. So in verse 16, I'm going to read this. And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. So remember, Benjamin was found with the divination cup. And remember, Jacob didn't even want to send Benjamin down there because, you know, that was the only son left of his uh, wife, preferred wife, Rachel. Right? And so Joseph has set this whole thing up. And we see Judah putting himself on the line here because in verse 17 he says, And he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O oh my Lord, and he's talking to Joseph, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word into my Lord's ear, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. So he's saying, I'm recognizing you as high as Pharaoh. And then he says, my Lord asked his servants, saying, have you a brother, uh, ye a father or brother? And we said unto my Lord, we have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And then when we go down, we're going to skip a little bit, okay? Um, so I want to go down to 32, verse 32. So for the people online, we're watching Genesis, reading Genesis 44. Go to verse 32. He says to Joseph, this is Judah talking to Joseph. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father. Now therefore I pray thee, verse 33, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, referring to Benjamin, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his, his brethren. For how shall I go up with my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come on my father. So we see Judah interceding to sacrifice himself for Benjamin. So this shows Judah's changes. Because remember earlier, Judah did two things that, that are recorded in the Bible that we know are bad. The first thing we know, he sold his brother into slavery. It was his suggestion, right? What was the second thing that he did? There was something else Judah did that was not a good thing either. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, yeah he's, he slept with his daughter-in-law, okay? And then he wanted to burn her, right? Not knowing it was his daughter-in-law and that that was his unborn child, right? So this is interesting that we see that Judah is showing real repentance, okay? So repentance acknowledges guilt before God. The brother's repentance grieves the sin that they hurt their father. They're saying this here. We hurt our father. That's, we hurt another human being, Okay. And then, um, our true repentance grieves the previous sin that hurt our family members, our friends, our neighbors, and maybe even people we don't like, right? Um, the brother's repentance means they did not want to commit another sin to grieve their father. Because we see here what Judah says, I see the evil that shall come on my father. This is a translation issue because this is the King James. He's saying the pain, the hurt that has come to my father. So I don't want to hurt him again. That's repentance. Okay, so let me ask you this question. That's dependence in relationship to in the past they didn't, yeah. they didn't bother with it. So all this repentance that you're speaking of right now is not expressed, we repent, we are sorry, and so to speak. It's all by inference of seeing what they're doing. Yes, okay. yes. So, because I don't think he would say, oh, I don't want to see evil fall on my father again, and let me, unless he's lying. And, we don't know that, but it's, it, it, if we take what it says in Scripture at face value, it seems like repentance. Yeah, uh, that's interesting now when you come back to the part where does it, uh, is that, what, what is the reason they never told their father what had happened? Shame, yeah. guilt, I mean, we don't know, but I'm, I'm assuming. So let me ask you this question. Why do we Christians need to repent? So we're talking about the repentance of the brothers, especially Judah especially Judah, but also Reuben, because Reuben says to them in 45, see, you guys did this, I didn't want you to do this, right? So we know for sure Reuben and Judah, there's some guilt and repentance, right? For sure, we know that. Um, so why do we Christians need to repent? Why is that important for us? Somebody tell me. Because we do wrong also. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. What were you going to say? You, you were saying something. No? Okay, I thought somebody else was talking. Okay, 
Somebody else in uh, the congregation tell me why do we need to repent? I have an answer, but I want to see what you guys say. Why do we need to repent of our sins? One of the things with repentance and, and, and feeling wrong, it, it puts us in a better frame of mind. Uh, it, it helps us go through, live our lives without this, this thing of guilt hanging over our heads. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of people carry guilt, and that's destructive to you. I, that's not what you're looking for, but that's what no, I'm it is. It is part of what I'm looking for. So, how is guilt? How is holding on to guilt for something we did that we haven't repented for? So, let's say you do something, so and you're unrepentant, but you have guilt. How is that destructive? It plays on your mind. Right, and then what happens? Destructive behavior. Destructive behavior. How does it affect our relationship with God? So we've said we're unrepentant, we're carrying this load of guilt in our mind. How does that affect our relationship with the Lord? Yeah, we don't want to seek Him because we feel like I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to come to you. We hide from God. We don't hide ourselves, but God sees us. We can't hide from Him because He knows everything that we've done. Yeah, yeah, He does. He sees everything. Okay, so but somebody, oh, go ahead. But doesn't it also uh, interfere with God's relationship to us in a way? Uh, when we, as Christians, because you you indicated this for Christians, right? Uh -huh, yeah, I'm talking specifically about Christians. Christians. Uh, one who calls Jesus as Lord. Uh, now you're not you're not repent of something that, as we discussed earlier, that is uh, um, all sin is against God, first of all. Uh -huh. And so here you've not repented, you're not repentant of it, or are you embarrassed, or whatever the reason you want to do it. Uh -huh. You have obstructed the, a clear path between you and God. Now that's hard for a lot of people us to understand because we see God as a loving, caring, understanding. But he doesn't wash away sin. He doesn't put away wrongdoing. He covers our sin if we repent. When we repent, right? Unrepentant, you know, he will not. He will not alter. You know, he still. You still have an obligation to him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can somebody read Exodus twenty verse three? Somebody turn to Exodus chapter twenty verse three. Go ahead. Yes. Before we repent, I mean, before we repent, I mean, to God. Yes. Setting aside among ourselves, I. I think it's the reverse. We need to confess our sin to God first because he's the almighty. He's the maker. He's the ancient of days. And then if he... He's it, the rule maker. Right, he's the rule maker. <laughs> then we can talk to the person and apologize to them. But we need to tell the Lord first because it's a hard issue. Yeah. I thought we must agree on earth. First, before you, you know, said, right? Well, I, what I'm saying is it's the reverse. We should okay. apologize to the human being we hurt, but I'm saying we need to repent to the Lord first. And then? And then we can talk to the person. But we need to, because, you, you know, have you ever had somebody tell you I'm sorry and you know they, they weren't? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Everybody's had that experience where they've, someone's given you a fake apology. We see politicians and celebrities do it all the time. They'll say something racist or sexist, in the media, something anti-woman or anti-black or anti-Asian, anti-whatever, right? And then their publicist, their lawyer goes, you need, to, you need to apologize. And then they get up and they give this fake apology, and only God knows their hearts, but it seems very insincere. It doesn't seem genuine, right? Okay, but if you repent to the Lord first, you know, the Holy Spirit changes us, right? And then when we go and say to the person, you know what, I'm really sorry I did this to you back in 1986, or whatever it is, okay? All right, so somebody read Exodus 20, verse 3. It doesn't matter who it is. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. Can you read it louder? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. So when we don't repent, we're actually worshiping ourselves. Self-worship is idolatry. So we are making a statement to God in all of creation that our sins aren't really that bad. The natural conclusion is that if our sins aren't that bad, then we don't need a savior. We don't need a messiah. 
And we don't need a savior because we don't need to be saved. So relying on ourselves, this is a form of self-exaltation. It's idolatry. Can somebody read Galatians 6, 3? Galatians chapter 6, verse 3. Thank you. Okay, so we can deceive ourselves, right? Okay, so let me ask you this question. If we repent, and it's sincere, we repent to the Lord. And I'm not talking about repenting to a family member or a cousin. I'm talking about to the Lord. How does repentance change our relationship with God? How does true repentance change our relationship with God for the better? How does it change it? Now we have right relationship. We can, we're kind of walking together. Uh -huh. We're following God again. We're uh -huh. doing what He wants wants us to do. Uh -huh. uh, I know, uh, the love relationship is, re is 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 cemented again. Not not that God doesn't love us more. It's that we have we have that respect, that love for God that we did not show when we when we uh, what the Bible calls it committed adultery against Him. Right? That's what the Bible calls sin. Right? Uh -huh. it calls adultery. So okay. We, Repent of that adultery, yeah. and now we're back in relationship. Okay. Isn't that interesting? Where he will forgive us again? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And then we hold on to grudges against people for years, yeah. Yeah. but God forgives yeah. immediately. But we also talk about sincerity and sincerity, like you just mentioned. Well, what's, well, so so it was insincerity in that prayer. Ellen White says, when you sin, uh, uh, repent immediately. Uh -huh. And a lot of us, you know, love. Because we have to feel sincere about it. God is not going to say, he said repent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was a good point. So what I was going to say, and this has to do with what you're saying, is that repentance actually leaves us, leads us to restoration. Restoring our relationship with the Lord. So somebody tell me, what do you think is the definition of restoration? What's the definition of, and you just tell me in your own words. Putting back together something that's broken. Putting back together something that's broken. Somebody else. Thank you. Restoration. What is it? Stripping down something to build it back up. Stripping down something to build. Ooh, I like both of these. Stripping down something to build it back up. All right, Nicole. Anybody else? Restoration. What is it? That's a new life. Can you say it louder? Restore to a new life. Yeah, restore to a new life. Yeah, okay, so Merriam-Webster Dictionary says to restore means to give back someone or something that was lost or taken, to return, to put or bring back something, bring something back into existence or use, to return something to an earlier or original condition by repairing it, cleaning it. So that's the def definition of restoration. The Oxford Dictionary, I looked this all the stuff up, you guys. Oxford Dictionary says to bring back, uh, to reinstate, to return to a former condition, place, or position, to repair or renovate, to the process of repairing or renovating so as to restore it to its original condition. So when we repent, we're restoring our relationship with the Lord. I mean, God restores it, um, but that's what happens when we repent. So we see here, at least we know for sure, with Simeon and with Judah, they've repented, because Simeon's like, you know, I told you guys not to do this, right, 42. And then we see, um, in 45, we see Judah offering to sacrifice himself for Benjamin. I'll take the place of him. And we know none of them did anything. They didn't actually steal the divination cup. We know that, right? Okay. Um, so it seems that according to scripture, Joseph's brothers repented. At least we know two of them did. Okay. All right. We're going to skip ahead to Genesis 50. So we're going to the end of this week's lesson. I'm skipping around because I've got a lot of... Uh, points I want to make. So somebody, I'm going to have you guys split this up. Genesis 50, we're going to be reading 50, 15, excuse me, through 21. So Genesis chapter 50, this is after Jacob has died. So Jacob just died. Um, we saw that at the end of this week's lesson. And we are going to um, be looking at what the brothers say. So I'm going to ask Nicole if you have Genesis 50. Can you read 15, 
16, 17, and 18. Okay. And then, uh, let's see, Brother Ron, can you read 19, 20, and 21? So we'll have Nicole and Brother Ron read. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are able to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs that they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. Okay, Brother Ron, 19. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people's lives. Now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we just talked about true repentance for like 15 minutes. Last week we talked about forgiveness. We can see here Joseph forgave his brothers. So this whole story, I'm looking for a specific word, um, and I'm hoping somebody says it. This entire story from the time they arrive in Egypt from the famine all the way to chapter 50 where Jacob dies, and the brothers are like, oh, he's going to get revenge on us. And he says he won't. What is this an example of? All these chapters. So from the time the brothers arrive in Egypt to get food, all the way to Jacob's death, and then Joseph saying, don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to get revenge. What is this a good example of? Anybody? Don't Text me something to tell me. <laughs> Has somebody texted you? They can, they can go and chat here on live chat. They can chat that in if they want. Okay. I'm hoping somebody will. I was going to say this is a really good example of what reconciliation looks like. This is, you know, we think of all these big words, but this is a really simple term reconciliation, to reconcile. So we have the repentance of Simeon and Judah. I keep mentioning them because we know for sure they're repentant. We know for sure. And then we have Joseph saying, and I forgive you, okay, right? He's not holding on to a grudge, at least not at this point. Maybe he was when he first got sold into Egypt, but at this point in chapter 50, he's forgiven them. So this is repairing that relationship, okay? All right, so um, I wanna go to Genesis 46 and 47 to Sunday and Monday's lesson, so that's June 19 and 20. That's when Jacob slash Israel goes to Joseph in Egypt. So I'm skipping around because I got a lot of points I want to make and I don't have a lot of time. So we're going to Sunday and Monday's lessons, June 19 and 20, Genesis 46 and 47. Um, I'm going to have somebody read, let's see. Somebody. I'm going to deal with, uh... Something came out in yesterday's study that uh, online there's some question. Are you going to deal with uh, a, a, a true uh, forgiveness, uh, not forgiveness, uh, admission of guilt? Uh, what is the person? They come to you and they say to you, I'm so sorry. Repentance. That's it. Right. So there was a little argument in our, just not an argument, a discussion yesterday that many people feel that when someone comes to them and asks for repentance, uh, the, the, it kept coming up that this the insincerity of repentance. Like what we just talked about. Yeah. Insincerity, like when politicians apologize about something. Yes. Yeah. And, and are when people in the church offend one another uh, and there's someone and that person who was the offender comes and apologizes. And I'm, there was a big argument as, well, I, I just can't handle, some, some were saying they can't handle a quick apology, basically. It seems so insincere. Uh, and I'm wondering, 
we talk about the sincerity of this re repentance because we have men who are speaking a language that their brother doesn't understand. And he can hear them, and, and he he's like, oh, them. wow, it right. changed, yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. But they don't know he doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. And so they pour their hearts out, right? Um, how? Without sounding maudling, how do we pour our hearts out and say, really, I'm sorry, and a person looks at you and says, oh, you just, you know. It, it seems to me that uh, often repentance and how it's accepted and received depends on the relationship between the people prior to the offense. I've got a really good response for you. So. If someone, because you mentioned church, people in church offending uh -huh. each other, that, so I'm going to go with that example. We don't know if someone's insincere when they apologize. We're not supposed to be judging them. So it really comes down to not judging people. God knows their heart. If they're an insincere person and they're giving a faux apology, um, that's not up, up to us to judge that. We don't know. You know, that's up to God. Um, now, if they keep doing the same thing over and over again, then it, then that's letting us know, okay, they didn't mean it. Well, they, they went and turned around and did it again two Sabbaths later or whatever, but... But does it? For example, you know we sin over and over and over again. Yeah, but there's and some things you don't do anymore that you used to do when you were younger, right? That's when you're, when, when, I think I mean, when you're more mature. Right. But when you're younger, and younger could be at any age, right? It's right. A, a, in the, in, in the sense, any age where you have, you still have issues that you haven't overcome yet. I'm 76 years old. I still have issues I haven't overcome yet. Well, right? yeah. And I, and, and as a result, I am likely to offend you again. That's possible. Simply because I'm struggling with issues. But doesn't the Bible say we're supposed to give seven, forgive 70 times seven? Well, that's where we. The, 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 it's the sincerity issue. <laughs> How do we? Like I think you answered it well early. Uh, uh, we accept face value that the words that are given to us. We, that, that's my thinking. If a person comes to me and says, I'm sorry, I don't care how blithe and whatever, you know, I know that people have different ways of dealing with their emotions. Some people are, are kind of embarrassed and they laugh and they, yeah, I'm so sorry, you know. And, and, but their embarrassment causes them to react that way. But I, I guess my point is we can't, because we're not God, and we can't, we're not telepathic. Mm -hmm. We can't know, really, mm -hmm. if someone is sincere when they've offended us or they've done, or not even just said something offensive, they've actually done something. Yes. I mean, if someone apologizes and it's a fake apology, a faux apology, I mean, only God knows, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and I don't and think I it's our job to sit and, and, and judge and pontificate why I think he's being, he or she is being fake mm -hmm. when they apologize. We don't know. Well, it's interesting to think about that. I'll leave it at this point. Uh, when we express an apology to someone, people can either say, I appreciate it, or say something, or they'll give body language that indicates that maybe they accept the apology. But if we say we, if we indicate in some way or another to a person that we accept the apology, but within our hearts we're thinking that these people are lying to me, then we're being insincere ourselves. We're being, un, uh, we're, we're, we're breaking God's law ourselves in response to this. I think, I think this is why the Bible has so many verses about repentance, mm -hmm. forgiveness, and judging people, mm -hmm. not judging. Okay, somebody, sorry. Okay, sorry. No, it's okay. Somebody go to Genesis chapter 45, verse 28. And then somebody else, uh, Nicole, I'm going to pick on you. Cool. Can you go to Genesis chapter 46, Nicole, and read 28, 29, and 30? And then somebody else in the congregation read Genesis chapter 45, verse 28. 46, 28? Yeah, chapter 46, verses 28 through 30. That's for you, Nicole. And then uh, someone else read Genesis chapter 45, verse 28. That's the first one you want to read? Yeah. Then Israel said, It is enough, Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Okay. Go ahead, Nicole. Oh. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so a couple of things, pop quiz. How many years was Jacob slash Israel separated from his son Joseph? 
How many years? You're really, 22. 22 years. 22 years, yes, 22. So that's the first thing. Second thing, why did Jacob, actually I'm not gonna ask it this way. What is the symbolism of Jacob sending Judah first to go and, and, and uh, talk to, directly to Joseph to his face? What is the symbolism of Jacob slash Israel sending Judah to go do that? Anybody? There's something spiritually symbolic about this. Who is his first son? His Reuben. first son is Reuben, who slept with his stepmother, Bilhah. Yeah. Judah would be praised, right? They, yeah, so uh, what's the symbolism of Jacob sending Judah to Egypt to send this message to Joseph? Okay, everybody's silent, so I'll go ahead. I just wanted to see, I want to make sure you guys get a chance to talk, and I'm not taking up all the time talking. So Judah, you can see he's actually taking on these firstborn responsibilities, right? So that's the first thing. Um, who comes from the line of Judah? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Jesus. Right. Okay. All right. What happens at the reunion? What happens at the reunion between Jacob and Joseph? What happens at the reunion? It's in 46, chapter 46, and it is verses 29, 30, and 31. You don't have to read it out loud. You guys can look at it. But somebody just raise your hand and tell me what happens at this reunion. He was happy to see him. But he cried because he said, now I know you're alive. Yeah. Can you imagine how Jacob felt? He thought his son was dead for 22 years and he's alive. But you guys have to also remember, Joseph probably missed his father. He's in a foreign country. He's in a foreign pagan country. They don't have the same religious beliefs as him. He was in prison for a very long time. And you know, now he's governor, but he hasn't seen his dad for 22 years. Okay. So let me ask you guys this. Have you ever waited for something for a really long time? Meaning you're waiting for God to answer a prayer, either yes or no, but you're waiting for a really long time, like this type of waiting, right? Let me ask you another question. I see a bunch of nods, so I'm assuming you guys are all in the human experience with me. I'm not the only one who's gone through this. Have you guys ever had someone lie to you about something that you found out later they lied, years later? Okay, think about this. Jacob found out that his sons had been lying to him for 22 years. They knew that, they, that the brother Joseph wasn't killed by an animal. Because remember, they returned the coat, the coat of many colors torn up with goat's blood on it. They knew, and they'd be carrying the secret. So Jacob finds all this stuff out. So I just want you to reflect on this, because this is, this is we're all going through the human experience. This is a human experience, okay? All right, so let's continue. Um, yeah. You know, when you look at, uh, there are two things that happen, I think, to people, um, depending on how long the period of, regardless of how long the period of time, but we'll say extended period of time has happened between when one has received a, somewhat of a, 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 an insult against a non angry, you mm -hmm. know, they've insulted you, they've harmed you in some way, and you didn't know that they had harmed you, right? You didn't have no idea that they had harmed you. Uh, and then you come to find out, as Joseph, as uh, Jacob does, that his sons had all lied to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and that in the same breath, they discover that Joseph is alive. So they tell the good news first. Joseph is alive. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say in the Bible, but we know they had to clean Well, they had up. to tell him because he to went to Egypt right? to meet his son. Right. Yeah. So the question is, Joseph is alive, weighing that against the lie. How does Jacob receive it? I don't know. I think that's the question I hear you asking. You know, and, uh, and so I'm thinking about myself. Uh, I'm used as a perpetrator of ill against someone else, not the one that generally receives the ill against someone else, right? Mm -hmm. Buy from someone. And so from uh, uh, the point of view of receiving that ill will, not knowing that the person in my very presence all this time, you know, has been the one that's been, had lied to me about this. 
I, you know, uh, I'd probably say, like I've heard now, you know, since it was 22 years ago, I'd say, all's good. You know, Joseph's yeah. alive. You're sorry. I did it. I understand. Plus, I've had all those years to look at me. Yeah. And, and look at, and I still have these issues of favoritism. And you know what I'm saying? And yeah, yeah. I don't know if I would be yeah. so upset. I don't know. You know yeah. Maybe some would. But we, we don't really know because the Bible doesn't say, right. but we just know that he learned that his son was alive. And for 22 years, he thought he was dead. Yes. So my question is, have you guys, I asked you if you've waited for God to answer a prayer, and it took years. So let me ask you, while you were waiting for God to answer this prayer, did you have it settled in your mind to accept, like, well, this is just how things are? Mm. Or it can't get better than this, so I'm not going to really get my happy ending that I wanted. So you're waiting for a long time for prayer. Somebody else, no offense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you're waiting for a long time for a prayer, right? Whether it's a yes or no, but something definitive from the Lord. You've been praying for it for years, right? So I, I don't know if this is happening to you right now or if it's past tense in your life, like the prayer was already answered with a yes or a no. But if it's happening now or if it happened in the past, did you settle in your mind like, well, this is how things are? Or did you say it can't get better than this? I'm just, I just want, I'm trying to get you guys to think. Because you've got these two really interesting stories. Well, actually, you've got several stories here. You've got Joseph has had 22 years to think about this and process this and be angry and get over it, right? You've got Jacob has thought his son was dead for 22 years. And then you've got the brothers have this guilt over their conscience for 22 years. So they've got three stories going on here, right? So you've got Jacob who could get his rightful revenge, okay? You've got uh, Jacob slash, or sorry, not Jacob, Joseph, who could get his rightful revenge. You've got Jacob slash Israel who's mourning his son. And then you've got these brothers who know what the real story is, okay? And I'm comparing this to things in your life where you've been asking the Lord for an answer for years, not six months, years. And God hasn't said anything. Maybe he's been silent. Okay, all right. Um, what's really interesting about this part of the lesson is that we see three things. We see God's promise, God's children, and God's reunion. Okay, so can you guys tell me what, hold on just a second. I just lost my place in my notes. God's promise, God's Yeah, okay, I found it. Okay, so, in Genesis 46, everybody make sure you're in Genesis chapter 46, okay? And you're looking at verses, um, let's see, 46, look at verses 1 through 4. Genesis 46, verses 1 through 4. We've got, I think we've got 10 minutes left, not quite. Genesis 46, verses 1 through 4. So, God's promise to Jacob. Um, I want somebody else to read. Let's see. Uh, Kathy, do you mind volunteering to read Genesis 46, verses 1 through 4? So, Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to God and his father. And God spoke to Israel in the vision of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, Here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father, do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you of you a great nation. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will put his hand up your eyes. Okay, so what's the promise? Somebody you just heard Kathy read it. What is God's promise to Jacob? That he'll be with him. Yeah, yeah. He'll be with him until he dies. He'll be with him until he dies. That's when he closes those eyes, right? Yeah. He'll be with him until he closes his eyes. He'll be with him until he closes his eyes. Okay. Um, I want everybody to look at, we're still in Genesis 46. I want everybody to look at, we're not going to read it. We're not going to read the gene genealogy, but I want you to look at it. Um, look at verses 8 
through 24. I'm not going to have you read this, not at all, but I just want you to look at it. Be looking at it in your Bible, Genesis 46, 8 through 24. So we've got God's children. What is the significance, when this was written, what is the significance of giving us all of these kids and grandchildren of Jacob? What's the point in telling us, who cares? Like, why, why, why do we need to know this? Genealogy. Yeah, why is this here? So we hear, we get God's promise to Jacob in verses 1 through 4. Then we skip down, and we've got his sons and his sons' sons and his daughters and his sons' daughters. And all of his seed brought he with him into Egypt. I'm looking at verse 7. And these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. And then it goes through all the names. I'm not going to have you read it. I'm not going to read it. But I want you to look at it. What is the point? My question for you guys, what is the point in listing this genealogy? He wanted us to know that he fulfills his promise. He said, I'm going to make you a great nation. So here's the nation or a part of the nation that I have fulfilled you with. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. All right, Nicole's going to teach the class. Okay, so yeah, he's fulfilling his promise. I'm going to make you a great nation. The promise to whom originally did he make the promise to? Abraham. And that is Jacob's grandfather. Right, okay. All right, so um, this is really interesting. It lists Jacob's children and their children. So this, there's a lot at stake here. There's a lot at stake. What is at stake here? With, with this famine and all of these descendants of Jacob. What's at stake here? Giving you guys time. It's, it's the, the, that which will come forward. Yeah. The unfolding of this promise. Yeah, the destination of all nations. Yeah, yeah the destination of these nations. Okay, so um, let me ask you, um, we have God's promise, God's children, and God's reunion. What happens at the reunion? This is easy to answer. Joseph, yes. Yeah. I mean, really, yeah. Yeah. Where uh, so much so that the household, they could hear. Yeah. This is symbolic of when we get to heaven and we're going to meet with all of these relatives of ours after the second coming, when they're resurrected. We're going to meet them, and there'll be tears of joy. I want you guys to think about people who you lost over the years. I think about my dad. I lost an uncle this week. You know, so when you think about this, this reunion, that we're, this amazing reunion we're going to have in heaven at the second coming. I want you to, and, and ancestors you're going to meet. All those ancestors that God is going to call up from the grave, and they're going to be in their whole bodies. Amen. Yeah. I'm laughing because we go look around and say, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've got, I've got my glasses. We have five minutes. Okay. Um, I think that's funny. So Genesis 48 and 49. So we're looking at Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm not going to have time to really go through it because of time, but we're going to briefly look at it. I'm going to ask Kathy to read Genesis chapter 48, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to ask Nicole to read Genesis 48, 13, 14, and 15. So Kathy's going to read 48, 5, and 6, and Nicole's, Nicole, I'm just picking on you today. Uh, Genesis 48, Nicole, 13, 14, and 15. So Kathy, if you have it, go ahead. And now your two sons, Ephraim and Esther, who were born to you in the land of Egypt, before I came to you in Egypt, are mine, and Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. Your offspring, whom you beget after them, shall be yours. Okay. Very good. Okay, so we see right here, um, we see that Jacob is elevating Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay, those are the children of two, two children of Joseph. And they're going to be part of the tribes of Israel that we read about later after the Exodus, right? Okay, because we don't really read about the tribe of Joseph. We always read about these two tribes that represent Joseph because they're his kids. And that's what she was reading. Uh, Nicole, go ahead and read 48, 13, 14, and 15. Thirteen. 
13, 14, and 15, yeah. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim on the foot towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left towards Israel's right hand, and brought them close to him. But Israel reached out his right hand and put on Ephraim's head, though he was the younger, and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Fifteen? Mm -hmm. Then he blessed Joseph and said, May the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, mm -hmm. the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. May they be called out by my name and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. Okay, so he blesses them. Let me ask you guys this question. Why did Jacob reverse the order of his grandsons? So you got one that's a firstborn, one that isn't. Why did he reverse the order? Anybody? He's a prophet. He has prophetic insight. Yes, Jacob's got prophetic insight. So he put, um, he put Ephraim before Manasseh. So I'm going to go through this, and then we're going to end. We're going to close. So Jacob did have prophetic insight. You're right. God gave that to him. So at one point in time, after crossing the Red Sea, going into Canaan, the tribes split into the northern and southern kingdoms. I'm just giving you some Bible history. So Jeremiah 31, 20, don't, we're not going to read it. The northern kingdom would just be referred to as Ephraim. Okay? Ephraim was listed before Manasseh in the list of generations. He was listed in the list of descendants first. In the allotting of tribal territories in what we now know as modern-day Israel and Palestine, we see that um, he was the first in the allotment. That's in Joshua 16.8. Um, when they were making the tribal divisions, he was the first. That's in Numbers 2.18 and 20. He was the first among the tribe chiefs. That's in Numbers 7.48 and Numbers 7.54. He was first among the judges. So we got the judges, the book of judges in the Bible. Um, but before Judges, we have the book of Joshua. Joshua, who fought the battle of Jericho, was from the tribe of Ephraim. And so was Gideon. Okay? So, also with the kings in 1st and 2nd Kings, King Jeroboam was from Ephraim. King Jehu was from Manasseh. Jeroboam came first. Ephraim was the first for the blessing and the birthright. So, we have this, we show, it shows that, that God gave Jacob prophetic insight. And... Can I, do I have one minute? Yeah. One? Okay. Thumbs up. All right. Let's go. Let's dive deep into this for like one or two minutes. Okay. Everybody turn to Deuteronomy 33. And keep your finger in Genesis 48. Or sorry, 49. Sorry. So go to De Deuteronomy 33. Keep your finger on Genesis 49 or put a pen there, or, or earmark it, however you guys do it, so you don't lose it. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So De Deuteronomy comes after uh, Numbers. Okay. And in, ver in chapter 33, because we don't have enough time, but I want you to look at this. We have Moses in 33, um, he's actually talking about the tribes. And he starts in verse 5. So Deuteronomy 33, 5, I'm not going to read it. I'll read a little bit of it, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. We just don't have time. And so Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king in Yerushalayim. I don't know how to say that. When the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were to gather together. So let Reuben live and not die. And he goes through each of these tribes that are descended from each brother. Reuben, then Judah in verse 7, and then in Deuteronomy 33, verse 8, and then Deuteronomy 33, verse 9. And he goes through all of these brothers, okay, the sons of Jacob. So I want you to compare this when you have time at home and you're like sitting in your Sabbath afternoon and you're going into a food coma. This is a chance for you to look at something. Look at Deuteronomy 33 this afternoon. When you're, you're at home and you're like sitting there, what am I going to do this afternoon? Deuteronomy 33, compare it to Genesis 49. And then, 
I want you guys to go to Revelation. Everybody go to Revelation 7. So we're skipping way, 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 way ahead. Revelation 7. So now we're at the end of the Bible. Revelation 7. We're going to look at 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And I'm actually going to have you guys read this. So I didn't have you read Deuteronomy 33. It's pretty long, but I'm actually going to have us read this. Um, I'm going to read this right now. So, Revelation chapter 7, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. All right. We're looking at the end of Earth's history. So, I'm going to start at verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So we have the 144,000. So verses 5 through 8, it just says, of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Neph uh, Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh. That's Joseph's son. We're sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon, we're sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi, we're sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar, we're sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon, we're sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph, we're sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin, we're sealed 12,000. After I, I'm trying not to cry. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could name. Of all the nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood over the throne Amen. and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood about the throne and about the elders, and the four beasts fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. So... We've got these brothers who've done some horrible things. And these are their descendants, okay? And then we've got spiritual Israel, which is what we are, okay? I'm not talking about genetics anymore because we know that the 10 tribes got carried off. So just want to clear that up if anybody's like, oh, these are their actual descendants in Revelation. They're not. The 10 tribes got carried off. But that name still lasts. That name. Wow, go girl. The name that God gave them, and God's going to give us a new name. Amen. So let's look at what these names are. And they're put in a very specific order in Revelation chapter 7. So it starts with Judah. Judah was a trip, right? Judah was tripping throughout the, the book of Genesis. He's the one who said, we're going to sell Joseph to slavery. And then he's the one who slept with his own daughter-in-law and then wanted to burn her for a sin that he had committed, right? But Judah's first in the list. Judah means I will praise the Lord. Reuben's next. He has looked on me. Gad means give him good fortune. Asher means happy am I. Naphtali means my wrestling. Manasseh means making me to forget. Simeon means God hears me. Levi means join to me. Issachar means purchased me. Zebulon means dwelling. Joseph means will add to me. And Benjamin, son of his right hand. So this is about how God saves the church, where his bride throughout world history, through the beginning of the church, after Christ's ascension, through the dark ages until 2022. So this is what it says. I'm going to put it together. All the names of these tribes into a sentence. It says, I will praise the Lord, for he has looked on me and granted good fortune. I am happy because of my wrestling. God is making me to forget. What? Our troubles, right? God hears me and has joined me. He has purchased me a dwelling and will add to me the son of his right hand. Yes. Where is Jesus Christ? Yes. And he's at the right hand of God. And he's interceding on our behalf. Yes. So these brothers, yes. these horrible brothers who did horrible things, they did some awful things. But their names are written here. Yes. Wow. Wow. And their names are being used to represent the 144,000. People that are going to be saved at the end of time. Yes. But don't get caught up on that, because people get hung up on the 144,000. Are you a part of the 144,000? We see here, there's a multitude that right. no man can Amen. name. That's Native Americans. Yeah. That's Come Palestinians. Come on. Mm -hmm. That's Africans in Nigeria and Ghana. That's people in Papua New Guinea. 
That's people that lived during the Roman era. That's people that lived, your ancestors that lived thousands of years ago. Yes. Being resurrected from the grave in heaven. And man, a name that no man can name. Teach All right? So that's what I wanted to get to you guys today and the importance of Judah. Jesus Christ comes from the line of Judah, and Judah wasn't perfect. Right. And actually, Jesus comes from the genetic line of Judah. Right. This shows that God can use anybody. Yes. So we give up on people, we're like, uh, yeah, yeah. God can use anybody. You can use anybody. Okay, I'm going to close. You. So do you mind saying a prayer, Annette? No? Okay, go ahead and pray. That's our good. Our Father and our God, we thank you, Lord, that you have welcomed us into this, your house. We ask that your Holy Spirit will continue to rest and hover and abide over your house as we worship you. For you are great and greatly to be praised. There is no other God but a seeker. And we're honored to be called your children. Anoint everything that will be done in praise and honor to you today. Touch each speaker, each singer, each musician, each worshiper, the ushers, the, the, the communications people. Lord, thank you. And thank you for the word that you used, Kylie, to bring forth this morning. Let it rest in our spirit so that this afternoon or sometime in the week, will review and, and remember those gems and nuggets of your word that were deposited in us today. We thank you, we love you, and we trust you in the mighty name of Jesus.
for bringing us to the presence of God um, even just a little closer. By, by show of hands, and, and don't feel bad, but just by show of hands, did anybody make it out last week to Juneteenth in the park? Sister Ned, sister, what's your name, sister? Rosalyn? Okay. Now, I'll pass him around. I don't think he's made yet. But I, oh, okay. Okay. Nice to meet you. Well, uh, just so you know, if you, if you weren't able to make it for whatever reason last week, um, those of you who know already, we're, we're pushed in the envelope. You know, we're called beacon light for a reason. Right? When light comes on, it doesn't stay in one uh, designated area. It reaches everywhere. And so that's the thing we have, and my challenge for us is to be the light when we have the opportunity to do so. Uh, we have some more opportunities coming up this uh, summer, July 5 to 8. Who knows what's happening July 5 to 8? We have our summer camp going on for kids in Richmond. Amen. If you guys had to guess, ask, just top of your head, Not, we don't got a big capacity. But how many kids do you all think we have registered already? From the neighborhood? Any numbers? Just take a wild guess. 50? What, what else? What I hear? 100? What else? One more. 200? Well, we don't, got, we don't got the cash for 200 yet. But as of right now, as of last night, we have 78 kids registered for camp from the neighborhood. Just so rich, kids that don't know nothing about Seven Day Adventist Church, don't know nothing about the Sabbath, don't know nothing about our, our health uh, benefits, uh, you know, of, of eating clean meat. They don't know nothing about this. But they know that there's a summer camp where people are going to be there to love on them. Yeah. We're going to have a great time. For those of you who don't know, uh, we are partnering up with Elder Eddie Heinrich. Uh, he's from the Northern California Conference. He's bringing his summer camp on the run. So we're going to have a 35-foot-long rock climbing wall. We have an 80, he's coming with an 85-foot-long water slide. He's bringing archery. He's bringing camp to Richmond. Okay, he's bringing camp to Richmond. So we're thankful for his efforts as well. Uh, not only that, July 16th, this is where we have to just deal with the realities of where we live and where we go to church. Um, Richmond is still dealing, if you don't know, uh, Richmond is still dealing with gun violence. Um, some of the babies that we serve, I call them babies, but they're kids. Um, I visit them. We go to their apartments. Pastor Ryan and myself were at a, a day camp yesterday here in Richmond. Um, and, and they're still dealing with, with, with things of that nature when you grow up in a in certain neighborhood. Just so you know, the kind of kids we serve, because I'm going to go somewhere with this. We met a kid yesterday, and we found out that his mother is choosing her boyfriend over the kid. And that allows him now to be frustrated, angry, right? And, but, but that's the reason we're doing the work that we do. That's why it may seem fun, a day camp, water slide, archery, but there's a reason behind doing this kind of work. It's because kids like him, he's 10 years old, if no one intervenes now, that kid will become the teenager that is in that juvenile hall, doesn't feel loved, doesn't know how to love. So this is why the work that we do is important in Richmond. Because we see little kids, they're smiling, they're playing basketball, and all the while we have no idea what's going on and how that kid's feeling. And we just met this kid yesterday, Pastor Ryan and I, at this day camp. The Bible says, in John 15, verse 13, there is no greater love, there's no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. And the essence of this verse, family, I'm not preaching, I'm going to sit down a little bit. The essence of this verse is sacrifice. Wow. That's the essence of that Bible word. Obviously, this was talking about Jesus laying down his life for us. But the essence of this to us, the challenge for us is sacrifice, which really means then that, that there is no greater love than that of a friend who is willing to sacrifice for another friend. Wow. And the reason I'm talking about sacrifice is because we're taking a route, a, we're going to take more than 78 kids from Richmond to camp. Yes. We are. This, that's, uh, we're claiming that. Yes. But we need 
the church. And the reason I say we need the church is because I cannot supervise, I cannot attend to 78 kids on my own. Right. Pastor Matt cannot do that on his own. Right. Us too, Sister Annette and everyone else that's been involved, we don't have the, 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 the reach for 78 kids. We just don't. And so the reason I'm talking about sacrifice is because the camp is, the overnight camp and the day camp are both during the week. And I know we got jobs. And I know we got responsibilities. But the Bible says that there is no greater love than that of a friend who is willing to sacrifice for a friend. And these are not just our friends, these little kids and rituals. These are our, this is our family. And so my challenge to us is to sacrifice, even if it is just one day of work, even if it is a whole week, whatever you can do, but I'm asking you all to, to, to accept the challenge of sacrifice. We're also going to be tabling uh, at this day camp, Pathfinders and Adventurers, Sister Annette School. So we need volunteers, even if we can only sacrifice a morning to table and tell kids about the Pathfinder Club, Adventure Club, the school for boys, or if you can sacrifice the afternoon around 3.30. Can you give us an hour of your morning or an hour of your afternoon? Right, so that's the challenge I wanna give you all, um, is, is let's take that challenge, let's be the light, let's be the light that extends yeah. to the community, okay? And so those are the two announcements I have that Pastor gave me, let's continue to keep Pastor Wilcock in prayer, as you all may or may not know, uh, he's just taking some time with his family, as he rightfully deserves. He will be back with us, not this coming Sabbath, but the Sabbath after, okay? So um, until then, uh, we're going to hold it down for Pastor Wilcock, okay? All right, let's continue to worship. All right, everybody. You know, one of the things the pastor said um, in his last sermon that I heard was about how we worship together, when we sing together, let's all be involved. So we, this is a part of worship, so we're not going to be busy, right? <laughs> Walking and greeting and talking and shaking the curtains and opening the windows. and we're, It's worship time, right? The song says, when we all, that's a declaration. Not if we all get to heaven, what a day. Or I hope we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing. The song says, when, huh? So let's stand together and let's sing together like we believe it. When we all get to heaven, you got to declare that in the name of Jesus. He did the heavy lift. All we have to do is accept the great and see our gift. I love the line that says, when we all see Jesus, what a damn rejoicing that will be, huh? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Come on, family. Be the one, great 
rejoicing. And we learned, uh, Jatan taught us uh, at our uh, session that we had last month, I think it was, that when you look at the word rejoicing in the Bible, it refers to dancing. So don't think you're going to be standing up there, bad knees and all, because he's fixing it all, right? You're going to have glorified bodies. So you'll be able to jump up and down. church started, I said, I'm getting dressed and the Holy Spirit said, change the second song. Do you see this? Yes. Does this make sense? Yes. The first song is beautiful. He is God alone. I know that's right, right? Yes. 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 But I'm getting dressed and the Holy Spirit said, change the second song. Not to the first verse. This is the third verse. I'm going to read it through first. God of our weary years, huh? God of our silent years. Thou who has brought us this thus far on the way. Thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Keep us, Lord Jesus, forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land. Y'all see? This makes sense now? Uh-huh. Holy Spirit knows what he's doing. <laughs> Let's sing together. God of our very Horrible atrocities. 
But in their spirit, those who knew the living God knew that it was their job to pray because we were coming. They knew. They knew. And if they made it, we'll make it too. We're going to make it because of the blood of Jesus. We're going to make it because of our testimony to one another. Isn't that what the Bible says? They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. We'll make it, y'all. He will keep us forever in his hands. And he promised he would never leave us or forsake us. So be encouraged, not discouraged. Be encouraged. Amen. Amen. You can take this Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And I always feel blessed yeah. whenever I come to Beacon Life. Yeah. In fact, since I've been coming here, I, there's something, there's a secret that I discovered. This place is blessed. <laughs> and one day I asked myself, how can I get take this blessing for me here to my house. <laughs> and after spending a few weeks thinking, I decided to open a business and call it Beacon Life. <laughs> and that's when the greater blessing started. I am blessed Amen. because what I learned from this place, I took it, I took it, I, I took it home and work it out and make it a greater blessing. All right. All right. Uh, my grandfather told me once that when you go to church, there are two things to remember. And while, while he was saying that to me, I was thinking about F, food. <laughs> <laughs> but I was so glad he said, remember the two Ps. Two P's, praise and prayer. Amen. We just finished praying. Uh, we just finished our praising. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to pray. It's prayer time. Amen. He said in Psalm 100 verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his court with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. So it's prayer time and we have the prayer wall so we know what to do. I invite you to come and get your pencil and a piece of paper. Write down what you need. Whatever you need. Nothing is impossible to God. Let's come at this time and get your pencil and paper and um, you can come now if you want to yeah if you need to you come now uh, one thing I put that when I when I'm when I pray or when I'm asking God something I need to take time to tell God that he is good is uh, this and that, you know. But something that we have to know. God knows who he is. He doesn't need you to tell him that he is good, uh, he is holy and all that. In fact, he's the one that is telling you who he is. He's revealing himself to you. Uh, one day, I didn't have any money at all. And I went to see a friend to ask for one dollar, to borrow one dollar. When I got there, I saw him and then I, I called him and he came. And I started telling him a bunch of stories after stories after stories and never asked 
tell him what I've come for. Until another friend passed by and said, hey, John, I need a dollar. <laughs> and he said, oh, man, I have only two, but I keep one for myself. I give you one. He give me. And I told him, I, I need a dollar, too. <laughs> and he said, you have been here for so long. Come on. Come on. You spend one hour telling me stories, but you never ask for what you really want want or need. So since then, I just make it short. I say, God, you know, I need this and that, you know. And I don't take time to say, you are good, you are this and that, you know. That's too much. When you need something, just ask for what you need. And then you have to explain later, you can explain later. But state what you want. That's what we need to do. You don't have to belong. Sometimes things happen. You don't have time to pray. You just say, Jesus. You know, that's it. So we're going to read the scripture. Our scripture for today is uh, Matthew 18, verse 21. Matthew 18, verse 21. Let's stand for the reading of the scripture. What book? Matthew, chapter 18, verse 21. We have only one verse, okay? I think we can read together. If you find it, say amen. Let's read. Then, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Up to seven times? Mm. May the Lord bless the reading of the scripture for our betterment, for our well-being. Thank you. Be seated. Well, it's time to pray for those of you who are able if you are able to kneel, let us kneel at this time and pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we come to praise you because you are good to us. Morning and evening, you are there for us. Since long before we were born, you have eyes on us. Until to this very minute, you are still with us, guiding us, showing us the way, blessing us, fighting for us. We just come to say thank you. We thank you for our children. We thank you for wise husbands. We thank you for our home, our work. We thank you for caring for us. Thank you for being so good. We thank you for being good life. We ask that you wash each one of us in the precious blood of Jesus, that you forgive all our sins and help us to make better choice. Help us to do better, to do good, to do your will, and to stay in the world. We thank you for setting apart this day so that we can come to meet you and worship you in the beauty of holiness and lift up your name a little higher and higher. We know that you are here with us, and we thank you for your presence. We ask that, that you don't let us leave this place without a blessing, a blessing that we can take home, a blessing that we can keep, a blessing that we can share, a blessing that we can talk about. Open our eyes and our hearts. Set us in the mood of praise and worship. Open our mind that we can learn day by day your word. 
that you can be strong and stand always on the wall of ages that we can continue to follow you and call you our, our God. Help us never to forget what you have done for us, to us, and through us in the past, and what you have for us today, and what you plan for us in the future. Thank you for your promises. Thank you that soon, very soon, you will come back and then we can be together forever and ever. Bless us, lead us, guide us. Forget not those who are not here today because of sickness or other difficulties in their lives. We ask that you dispatch your angels and your spirit to visit them, to comfort them, to inspire them, and to let them know that you still the God of heaven that sit high and look low. You still love them with an infinite love. You still planning to save them and to take them with you when the day comes. Bless us. Bless the speaker of today. Bless each one of us and help us to always be on your side as you are by our side. In Jesus' name we pray. And let it just say. Amen. Thank you. It's a small church with a big heart. Um, there's not too many churches. I'm gonna be very honest, you guys. If you guys heard me preach or talk to me, I'm just sometimes not the best thing, but I'm pretty straightforward. Um, there's not too many churches that I get excited about in regards to the ministry that's being done. Um, I've been. I was born Seven Day Adventures. My parents Seven Day Adventures. Brothers uh, Seven Day Adventures. Grandparents. And to me. The work that's being done in this church is it's beautiful. Um, it's amazing. Um, this is why I came to this church. I, this is why I left the church I was at wow. to come here. Because wow. I heard about the work that, that was being done at the light. Amen. And it inspired me. Um, the work that y'all already were doing and have been doing in the community. Um, and as you know, tied in offerings right now, but I'm a very practical person. If you can't tell already, I'm, a, I'm passionate about the young people. Uh, this is our shirt that we have for camp all summer. I belong, you belong, we belong. That's the message that we're giving to the kids this summer. Yes, right there. We have a, so if you volunteer with us, you get a shirt at no cost. Uh, but listen, y'all, no, for real, uh, two things. One, if you have this uh, little paper with your prayer, um, if you haven't been here for this part, you just come up here and you stick it on the wall and we pray over that wall. And so that's going to be the time to do it right now. Also, tithe and offering is right now. But the reason I said I'm practical is because I want you to know why you're giving. Um, I grew up in church, and I know this is just part of the program, but oftentimes, if you're not in a budget meeting, you don't know what's being done with that money, right? right? So I want you to know what we're doing, why we're asking. So last time I talked to Pastor Wilcock, I love our pastor. I love his heart. He, he's, been, he's been pushing, yeah, yeah. He's been pushing for us not to get a van, not a van, but he's pushing for us to get a bus. Not a bus just for any reason. He, his, his whole heart and his mind, and this is why another reason I came to this church, because he's thinking, how can we serve our community the best? How can we serve the kids that we're trying to reach the best? And his idea was, we need to get a bus. So we can, it's a 25 passenger uh, bus. We were trying to get that and we'll use that for all of the, for those of you who know, summer's just camps. But we do mentorship programs that's coming up again in September. We finished ours. Uh, we do community cultivation events. For those of you who were here, you saw it in action. 
And out here in this parking lot, we got about 80 people from the community on that Sabbath. And everybody was fed, everybody was given prizes, the kids loved it, right? And, and who took up the bill? The church did. So things do not, we want to do great things, but everything has a cost. Last time you heard me, I think I said the only thing that's free is the breathable air we have. Everything else in life has a price. So all the ministry we want to do, all the work that we're trying to do, all these camps, everything has a price. Right. And so right now, if this is the way that you can uh, support and sacrifice the mission that we're trying to do, the ministry we're doing, this is the time that you can give your uh, tithe, give your offering. Again, tithing, just so you all know, tithing does not stay in-house. Right. Tithing goes to the conference. We do not touch that money. We cannot touch that money. However, offering... All of that stays in-house. That's the, that's the offering that we use to do all this ministry. So there is two different uh, distinctions there. Uh, but you give as you want to give and as the Holy Spirit prompts you. But right now is the time, again, if you have a prayer request, uh, put it on this wall. Um, and if you have any type of tithing or offering you want to give, right now is the time to put it in this basket. Thank you, guys. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much, Lord, just for another day, another Sabbath, sunny day, uh, just to be together in your house, yeah. to praise you, to worship you, to encourage one another, Lord. And I just pray for all the prayers that you saw uh, pinned on this wall, Lord. We lift them up to you. You know what they are. You know if it's financial, if it's emotional, um, if it's, if it's, if it's uh, something at home, relationships, whatever it is, God. Uh, we lift it up to you, Lord. We give you our burdens because sometimes there are too much to bear, God. We also pray for the offerings and the tithe that were given, Lord. We pray that you would touch it, yeah. that you would multiply it, Lord. We know that there is nothing too hard for you to do. Lord, we give all of our plans, all of the ministries, everybody here, even the ones who are here, we, we lift them all up to you, Lord. Yeah. Forgive us of any sins that we may have committed. In Jesus' name, amen.
So this morning, uh, after special music, uh, we will hear our special guest preacher, uh, Pastor Weston Ryder. Uh, he is hailing all the way from Lake County, so let's, let's show him some love. Took the trip down here this morning. I, I'm not sure, is this, is this, your, is this your wife that you were here with? Yep. Not sure? Okay, I don't know, I'm not sure, but could have been a cousin or friend, I don't know. Right, right. Welcome her too. Um, and he's actually, he's actually one of our own. He grew up here in Richmond, uh, right? So he, he's coming back to his hometown. Um, he was born in Concord, but raised in Richmond. Uh, he went to De Anza High School um, out here. Uh, uh, husband to, to Cin Cindy Weston Ryder. Uh, he's father to Isabel and Christian. And most importantly, he is a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. So he... He will be the next voice we hear after our special music. church all right uh, everyone hear me okay yeah all right praise the lord it's good to be in the house it's good to be back in this area uh went to De Anza like uh, my brother said and uh had great years there and then met my wife she's from Hayward and so we went to PUC and then decided well it's a lot cheaper to live there than you know and that's just where the Lord said, hey, we need you here. Come on. So, praise the Lord. I'm so happy to be here at my church. We'd be at Potluck already. <laughs> but not here. We're praising the Lord. Yes. So, amen to that. So, it's just, it's just so good to be here. So, thank you, uh, Pastor David. Uh, his son goes to my wife's school. She's a teacher oh, up there at MS. She has uh, 24 kids. All right. Uh, and so, you know, his son goes there. So I see Pastor David, you know, all the time. I'm like, brother, what's going on? What's going on? And he tells me what's going on down here. I was like, well, if you ever have an opening, let me know. Because I'd love to go down there and uh, have some real worship service. Yeah. So we are here. So praise God. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. In Sabbath School, we were talking about forgiveness. Yeah. And uh, the message today is on forgiveness. It's called uh, remember me and oh, how wow. I came up with the title was Jesus says remember me and how I do it kind of Come right on. in my own words yeah. remember me and how I do it and Peter that we we're gonna be talking about today you know he didn't have the tools he didn't have everything 
And the Lord had to teach him some stuff, but in the gracious and beautiful way that Jesus does things is what we are going to do today and what we're going to go through today. So turn with me to Matthew 18, 21, which we read. And then, I mean, come on. It, <laughs> forgiveness is hard. Yeah. I mean, we're talking deep down, you know, oh, yeah, brother, uh, you, you owe me a dollar, you never paid me. Yeah, that's easy. Okay, I forgive <laughs> you, whatever. But when you get down real deep, Joe was a guy who was, uh, you know, he was making it in life. He had, he had everything going on and got pulled over. And he's like, oh no, this would be number five tickets in two months with this nice new car. And yeah, he was wrong. And he looks in the rear view mirror and the cop that pulls him over, it's his friend from church. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So he jumps out of the car and his friend's coming up and he's, he's like, you know, telling them like, hey man, how you been? How's your family been? And the officer says, uh, sir, please step back in the car. And he's like, well, he's not treating me too well. So he switches tactics and he goes a different direction. And no, sir, you need to get back in the car. And he gets in the car. So he's irritated at this point. And he knows he's going to get a ticket. And so in his mind, he's like, why did my brother treat me like that? You know? I mean, yeah, I was speeding, but you know what? Oh, I'm not sitting next to him at church. I, I'm not, you know, until cop goes back, starts writing things down. He's looking in the rear view mirror, just going, oh, man. Well, then he comes back up and rolls his window down like a half an inch, takes a piece of paper, because he's all irritated at him. So he takes it. And the cop drives off and he's like, yeah, okay, we're friends, all right. And then he realizes it's not a ticket. Wow. And he opens it up and he says, hey, Joe, I just want to let you know that, you know, two years ago, I lost my daughter to a speeding drunk driver. And that, you know, Every day I wake up and I want to forgive that person. I, I want to forgive him. And I think that sometimes I almost do. But then I think about he only served two years and three months and he's home hugging his kids and I will never see my daughter again. It's hard to forgive. And so he says, Joe, please slow down. I only have my son left. Wow. All right, family. So, yeah, we can sometimes forgive, but sometimes it's seriously hard to forgive. Yet, our Lord and Savior hung on a cross and said, forgive them for they know not what they do. So, in Matthew 18, 21, if we're there, amen? Are we there? Amen. All right. So, Peter says... Yeah, I'm getting old. Let me put my glasses on. Okay, so Peter says, which we read, he says, you know, like, Lord, like seven times. Is that okay? And their custom was like three times. So Peter is thinking, well, I'm going to show the Lord. I'm going to double that, throw an extra bonus one in there, and whammo. What do you think about seven times, Lord? And the Lord sees right through him. Right. He says, oh, righteousness by works. Oh. Is that what we're doing? Mm. Okay. Uh, okay, okay. Well, how about this, Peter? What about seven times 70? And then Peter like, well. <laughs> and the Lord probably, he just loved to look at people's faces when he really gave them the straight truth, huh? And he's all, mm hmm And he says, well, let me just tell you a little story then. And then he carries on. So he tells them. Let's read it together. Or at least some of it, family. The king would call in the people that owed him money, that owed him a debt. And when he called them in, they brought forth this one that owed a significant amount. Mm -hmm. You see how much it is there, family? How much is it? 
Yeah, about 10,000. Now, if it's 10,000 gold talents, if the golden talent was 20 years wages. So if you go, let's say silver, let's cut it in half, 10 years. Still, it's more than a lifetime you can work off. Right, right. All right? It's unheard of. So he brings him in and that servant says, I don't have the money. And this he says, all right, no problem. I'm going to sell you. I'm going to, I'm going to throw you in jail. I'm going to sell your family. I'm going to sell your house. I'm going to sell everything that you have. We'll make that debt up. But the servant fell down and says he worshiped him. And he said, I'm sorry. Please have patience with me. I'm working through this. Right, family? Come on. Sometimes we're working through. Mm -hmm. And so, as he's, wait, wait. So the king takes compassion on him and says, you know what? I forgive your whole debt. Mm. Bam. Mm. He doesn't just gain that money that he all spent, right? I mean, because the debt's gone. What's he got? He has his family. He has his kids, his wife, his house, all of his belongings he has. The king gave it back because he was going to take it all for what he had done. Well, then it says that servant went out and he did wicked. Amen? He went out and it says that he knew someone else that owed and this amount of money Compared to the millions, when you look at it, was like $11. He was forgiven millions, and he grabbed the other servant by the throat and says, I want you to pay me. Even though that servant fell on his knees and worshipped and, you know, said, oh, please, please have patience with me. No, he wasn't going to have any of it. So the other, other servant seen it, and they went to the king. And the king brought him back and said, what have you done? Mm -hmm. And it says he gave him over to the tormentors. Mm -hmm. So this guy could not let, he could not let go of the debt, right? That someone owed him mm -hmm. and lost everything, right? I mean, that's, that's not me saying it's the word. He lost Everything because he couldn't let go of a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you think about, I like to take this verse and I like to think, yes, the, the servant said, okay, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. And then it says he went out, but it doesn't say he went out immediately in, in the King James. I say maybe he went out two years, three years later. Mm -hmm. Huh? We say, oh, man, yeah, I came to the church 10 years ago. God forgave me on this. And then as time goes on, we don't want to really forgive, right? Wow. I don't know. I'm just saying. Yeah. Sometimes we forget the awesome gift that God has given us yeah. in forgiveness. That we go, oh, no, that person said that about me. Mm -hmm. Well, praise Jesus that he doesn't say that to me because I've said some horrible things. And he could have wrote me off a long time ago. Well, Jesus gives it straight to Peter here. He says that likewise shall my father in heaven do the same for those. So if you can't let it go, if you want to play the counting game of 70 times 7, you're going to lose. That's what he's saying. You want to do works? You're not going to make it. Well, this was Peter's first kind of, you know. But the Lord still had work, right? Because we're talking about Peter today. So turn to me to John. Follow me to John chapter 13, 36. So Peter... He, uh, like I was saying, he's gathering tools. Jesus is giving him tools, right? And I know none of us have ever been in this situation. We've never tried to, 
you know, run our own ship or, or tell Jesus how to do things. I mean, right? Uh, wrong. I do it every day when he says, hey, I need you to do that. I'm like, really, Lord? No, that donut looks good. I mean, come on, family. I mean, that's for real, right? We have the health message and uh, let's keep going. We're not getting on any other sidetracks here. We're going forward. So Simon Peter said unto him, where are you going, Jesus? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you can't come yet, but you'll follow me later. We've heard this. But Peter saying, Lord, no, I can follow you. I have all the tools. Wow. I have them all. I am ready. In fact, I am so ready, Lord. I know you don't know it yet. But I'm telling you, so that you will know it, I have all the tools and I'll even die for you. What do you think, Jesus? Well, Jesus is quite encouraging. He says, well, I think before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And I only... With our mind's eye, I look at this scripture and I go, well, how would I be? And I would be, I'm just being truthful. I would be right, Lord, <laughs> right? Because my spirit is willing, but the flesh Come is on. weak, Come on. right? So when the Lord, you know, and, and I'm like, I wake up and I'm like, this is the year for my great diet plan. Woo! And I'm ready. And I'm ready to get it on. And I mean, I'm ready to do it. I mean, I'm, my spirit is strong. And I'm like, okay, I'm only sticking to this and doing this. And about day one, I'm like, where's the sugar? I mean, I'm just being honest. And I'm like, oh. by day three, I'm like, forget it. Forget it. Right? Because Jesus understood. And Peter didn't. That, yeah, man, you, you're spiritually, you may think you are ready and you are, take on the world and you're ready to do it, but you don't have all the tools yet. You don't. And Jesus was trying to tell him, hey, slow down. I'll get you there. Remember me and how I do it. Amen? So... So he, Peter does, Peter does do it. His, he doesn't really believe Jesus. And in Matthew 26, 75, he does exactly what Jesus would say he would do. Right? Yep. He denied him three times. And he wept bitterly. Mm. But see, Jesus knew that would happen. And so... In 14, where he says that you will deny me three times before the conqueror, he doesn't leave them there. He encourages them, right? Family, we know this. He says, Peter, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So we know this, right? So even though Peter is knows, I mean, come on, I wish we were like Jesus. Even though Jesus knows Peter is going to just say things about him, he's going to cuss and swear, he has bar language coming all out of him, he's going to be chopping people's ears off, he's going to be going all these different directions. Right. And yet Jesus gives him this word, Peter, I'm going to get you there. I am going to get you there because I'm building a house for you. You think I'm going to waste time building a house in heaven because you're not going to get there? Sisters and brothers, that's the same for us. I mean, I know sometimes it's tough and it's tough to forgive. But Jesus forgave. And I just want to be more like him. And I know you guys do too. Amen. 
And that's why we're here today. We're here to turn it over. Yeah. We're here to say, Lord, let the gates of heaven open up and let the rain fall yeah. upon us yeah. that we can forgive yeah. our brothers and sisters, yeah. that we can be, whoo, when we get there, Lord, I knew that house was going to be awesome. <laughs> I just knew it. And the most important thing is I knew that Jesus would get me there. Yes. And that's what we have to know with the times that are coming. Faith that is just unstoppable because Jesus Christ is in us, not just that we know him. Right. So, Jesus says, I got a house for you, but... So when he wept bitterly, you know, he could think back of what Jesus told him. And I don't know, but that could have been a huge difference between what Judas did and what Peter did. They both denied the Lord. Wow. One had the encouraging words and took it to the heart, and the other one took it to the tree. Wow. So I don't know. Let's just think about it. That's, so in John 21, 15, turn with me now. We're moving through. John 21, 15. So this is after... Jesus is crucified and he comes back three times. This is the third time. And he meets them. They're fishing. And Jesus has the fish and the bread. And he's, you know, welcoming them. They're going to have dinner. And so back in those days, and I wish we did it more today, but we don't. But he denied him three times. And a, a public denial meant that you needed public forgiveness. So Jesus knew this. So just, let's just say, for example, you know, I yelled and screamed at someone in the middle of the street. And I was like, oh, that was dumb. And I go over to him, you know, and I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, bro. No one else knows that. Right. You know, they're thinking, well, that guy. And now they're like, I mean, what's going on? So to go out there and go, yeah, I am sorry. You know what I mean? Then everyone understands what's going on. And Jesus understood this. So Jesus goes to him in 15, uh, 21, verse 15, and he says, Simon, son of Jonas, you lovest thou more than these? You love me more? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Man, there's still some in there. There's still some of, yeah, I'm going to run my own ship in there. And Jesus says, no problem. So he keeps asking him. And the third time he asks him, it says that Peter is broken. He doesn't believe that his Lord believes him. And that if you think of Peter, he had the spirit. He had the motives. He wanted to do it. He just wasn't channeled right and he didn't have the tools right. But God knew this. And so he trying to funnel them in the right direction like so many of us when we kind of offend people and we kind of do i mean we mean well probably but we squished a couple of people to get there you know and, and it's only when we look down and our shoes are messed we're like oh i wonder who i stepped on to get here but i know the lord wanted me here because i prayed about it well we need to pray more sometimes. Amen. Right? And for the Lord's will to be done, not ours. Oh, amen. Yes, Lord. And that's where we are today in forgiveness. Because yes. the, the thing is, is the Lord's will to be done to forgive others. We know God's got us. Right? Amen. So he says, he says to him the third time after Peter's heart is just crushed and broken and he says then feed my lambs and what he was doing here was first feed my sheep you can take care of the big people but now you are humbled and you are willing i can release you to the little ones bring the little ones unto me right jesus said and right the same with peter now you know, he wasn't going to start squishing. Everyone was important. Everyone was important, family. Wow. Wow. And so, as the, um, 
it's just, uh, I get lost sometimes because I just think of so much of the love of Christ. And, and so one, one thing is the significant of this whole thing here is that Jesus asked him, do you love me? And that was the only question for service and discipleship. Do you love me? You do? Then you are free to go and serve and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Family, do we love Jesus? Then we can serve. And I know here at the Beacon Light, just being here and knowing that the light is going off everywhere. 78 and more young kids changing lives. And if the Lord des decides to delay and they grow up and have kids, that's, right. you're never going to count it. Right, man. Mm -hmm. And that's because we decided to do it now yeah. and take those little tiny yeah. things out of our pockets, little money that we know is not going to be. Let's build the kingdom. Come on. Yeah. That's what we need. Amen. Build the kingdom. So he's ready for service and discipleship and yet Jesus knew that Peter would run into hard times right he knew he would and anyone who's like Peter you, you uh you need this encouragement even though for some people it wouldn't be encouragement it kind of depends on your your personality right and if and I'm kind of that way you know march forward oops I stepped on someone kind of guy right but this would be encouraging to me. And Jesus tells Peter, he says, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself up and walkest wherever thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch out thy hands and another shall gird thee up and carry thee where thou wouldest not want to go. What he was telling Peter was, I'm going to get you there. You will die serving me. Wow. You will not give up. You will not fall short. I will get you there. Amen. You will remember me and how I do it. And you will model your life after me. In as much as they will crucify you upside down. Because you wouldn't want to die in the same way that I did talking about the Lord. I will get you there, Jesus tells him. And that is something that people like Peter's need. I need to know, am I going to make a difference, Lord, with you? Am I going to make it to the end? That's what we think, right? Am I going to make it? Well, he made it to his end. It doesn't matter if we make it till Jesus comes. We make it to the end that Jesus wants us to make it to. Amen? Amen. And he encouraged us. And so, Peter made a lot of mistakes. Maybe some of us never have. Maybe I've made more than, so you guys don't have to. That'd be kind of good, right? But there was a young, young man, Mark, he's 20 years old, who was driving home from a night shift at the fire station, and he got tired. Just 20. Working hard, trying to make his way in life. Fell asleep. He didn't wake up till he heard the screams and the mangling of metal when he slammed into June Fitzgerald's car. She was pregnant. Her 19-year-old daughter, Faith, was in the car. Faith would be the only one that would make it. Wow. June Fitzgerald, she would perish with her unborn child. And only her daughter, Faith, would make it. The boy came up to set me. He's 20 years old. Made a mistake, family. Made a mistake. Fell asleep. He's up and the judge is ready to hand down sentencing. And the door opens up. And little Faith and her dad comes in. And he says, stop. I... I am a minister of the gospel. He says, I forgive 
as I have been forgiven. Lay not this upon him. See, this is what we need to understand in this way. I need to. He understood the gospel. He understood Jesus as heartbroken as he was. Raising faith by himself now. Not having faith, not having his unborn child. He knew God would take care of him. And he knew God would take care of faith. Who would take care of this young man? Who could be sentenced? Who knows? I don't know what his sentence was. It's a true story. But he understood. He knew God would take care of him. So he met. Charges dropped. He met with Mark every month. 17 years later, they still meet. Wow. He still shows them the gospel of Jesus. Wow. Changed. He wasn't even a Christian. He could have whined and complained about losing his wife and all these things. But he said Jesus wouldn't. Because the gospel of Jesus is about forgiveness. If you want to count 70 times 7, Jesus says, I die for your freedom. You can count all you want. But if you don't want to count and you want to remember how I did it, lives can be changed 78 at a time. Amen? Amen. So... Let's just get it straight here, because I'm, I'm a Peter, okay? So, I know there could be Peters out there today in this congregation. Amen. I'm not talking out there, okay? <laughs> but we'll bring it home, okay? And there's so many times the Lord says, okay, let's go right. I go, no, nope, I'm going left. Lord says, all right, sit down. No, I'm standing up. That's how I do it. Lord says, take the high ground. No, i got to tell this person where he went wrong. I guess I'm taking the low road. Sorry, Lord. He says, how about you just be quiet for a second? But I can't hear a small but still voice while I'm screaming out loud. Where are you, Lord, helping me? How come you're not helping me? Amen? Lord says, follow me. No, Lord, I'm okay leading. I'm all right. Besides, what are you doing today, Lord? I mean, I'm out here, you know, busting pavement, trying to save souls. What are you doing? Right? I mean, there's so many things that we just, we just, okay, I understand, Lord. Jesus says, are you going to keep counting? Or are you going to forgive like I forgive? Are you going to forgive like I forgive? I freely forgive as I was forgiven. Thank you, family. appreciate you for coming. Amen. And Pastor always says, you come once, you are what? Visitor, you come twice? Amen. Family. So if you come back again, you're family? Amen. Yes. And that will, that will require you to do family responsibilities and duties. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, we appreciate you. Thank you uh, for, to your wonderful wife, the teacher, for coming, showing up. Um, the long drive, that windy road, um, and safe travels back. Um, so now it is time for our uh, benediction. 
and dismissal. Father God, uh, we thank you uh, for sending your minister here to us to bless us today um, and to just remind us to remember you, uh, most importantly, um, and to forgive, uh, not to count, not to, not to focus on righteousness by works. We thank you, God, that you are going to get us through, that you're going to get us to the finish line. We thank you that you're, you're not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. Yeah. And grant us the faith to be able to, to know that and to live that. Help us to, to not be uh, constantly seeking our will, uh, but being at peace with your will. Letting you lead, letting you have your way, and letting you be Lord over our lives. If there's anyone here that has, that is uh, felt convicted to give their life to Jesus Christ, I just pray that you just repeat this prayer after me. Father God, I confess uh, that I have done wrong. I confess that I need you in my life. Come into my heart and be Lord over my life. If you have said those words, welcome to the kingdom. And if you would like to be baptized, uh, email elderdavid1844 at gmail.com. So, Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the Sabbath. We pray that your blessings continue to uh, flow, continue to watch over us and lead us and guide us throughout this day. And as we begin our week, uh, we pray that we would walk into it refreshed, rejuvenated, um, and that we would follow your will and your way. We pray these things in agreement. In the name of Jesus, amen. You are dismissed.